Well, thank you very much uh, all for coming here to the LSE, to this, uh, I don't know how many we have had, but we have had quite a few events already at the Ganyala Blanche uh, Center since in this term. Last week, we had the Commissioner for uh, Cohesion and Reform, Elisa Ferreira, and today we have the pleasure of having Jimmy burns Marignon. I'm going to introduce him, but I probably he doesn't need a lot of introduction over here. I am uh, your host. I am the Professor of Studios Chair and a Professor of Economic Geography, plus the Director of the Kenya Blind Center, Andres Rodriguez Pose. And that person sitting over there is the manager of the center, Victor Perez Sanchez, who has been taking care uh, of all this organization. So thank you very much. Um, I've been at the LSE for almost 30 years. And I must say that the news that this is a, a cave full of spies is, is completely news to me. I, I never encountered one. I suppose that if they are spies, they're never going to tell me. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, yeah, apparently there are, there are quite a few, and there were even more uh, 40, 50 years ago, despite the fact that when I joined the LSE, it only had 2,500 students, so, so it was a much smaller place than the one we have uh, now. So today, Jimmy Burns Marignan is going to be talking about his latest book, A Faithful Spy, I suppose you call him a faithful spy because it's not one that crosses over uh, many, many times. But uh, I'm not going to say Walter Bell, who studied at the LSE, but I'm not going to talk about Walter, Walter Bell. You talk about him. I'm going to talk about Jim, who, for those of you who don't know him, he was born in, in Madrid, like myself, and was educated at Stonyhurst College. Uh, University of College London, where he did a BA in Modern Iberian and Latin American Studies. And then he came to the LSC when it was a much smaller place to do an MA in politics and government. He's a former Financial Times jo uh, journalist, where he worked as a foreign correspondent and senior reporters covering security and intelligence. So you've been versed in the, in the matter before and form part of the newspaper's award-winning investigative unit. He has contributed to international media across print, television, radio, and digital platforms. And his books published in English and translations include his prize-winning The Land and Its Heroes, How Argentina Lost the Falklands War, A Literary Companion to Spain, and then uh, the football books, which I think are for me, possibly the most exciting, The Hand of God, a biography of Diego Maradona, Barca, a people's passion, Cristiano and Leo, I'm still discussing who is best, who is best of the two. Yeah, Cristiano. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could have an endless discussion about this. And a Pope for, of good promise. But today, we're going to listen to the presentation of a faithful spy, the life and times of an MIC and MI5 officer. Jimmy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, Andres has taken me completely by surprise because I thought we were going to be in a, a sort of, in a, in a conversation, but uh, I mean, it'll probably be a conversation anyway with, with uh, all you here. And it's wonderful to see some familiar faces. Um, so I, I would have to uh, rearrange what I was, <laughs> was going to say. <laughs> but um, I think that just to, to give some sort of context, ha, ha, um, how, much, how long do you want me to talk? We have until 7.30. Okay, so... so I, it depends on how much okay. discussion you want to have with the audience. Well, I, I always love discussion, actually, as people know me. Um, <laughs> what, what I suggest, I, I will try and, uh, if, if I don't sort of uh, lose my voice or run out, I, I will try and finish... Uh, nearer to, to to seven and give about half an hour for the discussion if that's okay. Um, but um, and you know I won't I won't overrun. Um, I th I think just to give before I get in into into the book just to give some some context to it. Um, uh, and and Andres very sweetly and, and and thank you so much for for having me here and we thought I know you've been working behind the scenes, organizing everything, and also to my team in the British Spanish Society, Cristina and Maria, um, brilliant as always. Um, 
just to to sort of frame a bit about you know my my sort of involvement in this project um uh and also uh, you know given where we are at the lse connection um which is quite curious as as you will you know you will discover um as um as andres uh, pointed out um I, I was the foreign correspondent uh, for the FT uh, after LSE, um, and and then I, I well started covering intelligence and security. Um, as you probably some of you know only too well, uh, being a foreign correspondent in certain places immediately puts you, uh, if not in the firing line, certainly under suspicion, particularly in in countries that are, are run by totalitarian uh, regimes. Um, I happened to land in, in Buenos Aires uh, at the end of 81, um, when there was, as you, I'm sure most of you will recall, there was a most appalling uh, military regime there, um, the regime of the juntas, as we call them, uh, who were already responsible for the deaths of uh, from 15,000 to 30,000 disappeared. Um, which I had protested against as a as a postgrad student um, very actively, um, and um, so you know my my number was to some extent sort of slightly marked. Um, but the reason I was sent to as a, quite as a young guy uh, to to Buenos Aires this was a very FT uh, story, which is that my um, my editor at the time, who had no interest at all in international affairs, but was very interested in the city and, and industry, was taken out to lunch by the chief executive of uh, British American Tobacco, and who said halfway through the lunch, said, I think, uh, you know, the FT is underreporting um, Argentina. It's, it's a very interesting commodity market story there. Um, it's not just meat, it's grains, and, and it really should be, you know, at the centre of the FT's second section companies reporting, you know. Um, and poor old Jeff Owen, who is a wonderful editor actually, immediately got back uh, to HQ and went to the foreign desk and said, have we got anyone in Buenos Aires? And um, it was like something out of Eva and Wall Scoop, but, um, a, a rather kind of um, sheepish uh, uh, deputy editor of foreign news said, well, actually we have got someone We've slightly lost touch with him over the last five or ten years. I think he's got a rather bad drink problem and finds it very difficult to file any stories. Um, anyway, that was what Jeff wanted to hear because at that point um, I was not an alcoholic and I'm not today. Um, but you know, I was young, youthful, energetic, dying to get away from London uh, and looking for adventure. Um, and so I was thrown into this. Uh, environment um, and within a very short time uh, developing sources uh, I realized that uh, something was cooking and something very serious was cooking which is the planned invasion of the Falkland Islands um, and I began to realize this uh, quite a long time before uh, it was even kind of reported widely and and indeed the British ambassador at the time who'd gone completely native refused to make a fuss about it and um, um, but obviously British intelligence was was uh, beginning to uh, get quite worried anyway we were caught with our pants down as you as, as you know the uh, on the on the sort of second of April 1982 the Argentine armed forces invaded the Falklands and occupied it under under military occupation, uh, and and what followed was a full scale war, uh, which for the British under Thatcher became like a kind of um, reprise of the Second World War, probably the, the the last the last time, and not probably the last time that the entire uh, Royal Navy fleet uh, set off across the Atlantic twelve thousand miles away, the most extraordinary most extraordinary mini war, uh, which was won in the end. The reason I'm mentioning that is that um, halfway through that, um, my dear wife, uh, who has always been an extraordinary ally, um, had, was, was, had been working as an English teacher, her school had closed down, and she'd, um, 
uh, had to go across Montevideo to get away from the whole thing. By May, which was the middle of the war, um, I was pretty stressed out uh, and she was getting stressed out not being with me. So she sort of came back and I said, in a moment of sort of total lunacy, I said, well, why don't we just take the weekend off uh, and go to the uh, uh, to the Uasu Falls, which uh, we both wanted to always go and see on the domestic airline. Um, anyway, it just so happened that at that time I had purchased a, a little Minox camera, I don't know, of those little tiny little Minox cameras, uh, which used to be standard issue during um, during World War II and became even more of a standard issue for taking secret documents um, during the Cold War. Um, I also had a map uh, of the Brazilian Argentine border, which um, had a whole lot of crosses marked on, on it. Um, and uh, I mentioned this because as we were tr trying to go through uh, passport control and customs, um, we were arrested. Um, and I, I was accused of uh, espionage. Um, uh, under interrogation, um, we were separated, my wife was interrogated, I was interrogated. And the reason I said, you know, on what basis are you accusing me of espionage? And they produced my minox and they produced uh, my, my sort of map, you see. Uh, and so, do you see those crosses? That's the special services. The SAS are going to come across the border of Brazil and come into a secret operation into northern Argentina. And I said, not really. The reason those crosses are there is because I was educated by the Jesuits and a friend of mine told me where the Jesuit missions were. That so just gives you an idea of this complete lunatic world one gets thrown into. Anyway, cut that story short. Uh, I was, uh, we were both released uh, through an intervention of various people um, and, and I went on covering the war. I think. Then just to fast forward, because this is relevant in terms of um, my uh, engagement uh, as security and intelligence um, correspondent for the FT. Um, when, when you're uh, appointed to a role like that, you are uh, vetted, basically. Uh, vetted means that you've got a certain access to, to the security services and intelligence services uh, on the basis of mutual trust, uh, Official Secrets Act, certain things that you can cover other things you can't, but you are uh, you have access to information that Joe Public doesn't have, and then uh, you are guided as to what can be published or not um, in particular emergencies. And um, I, I began my beat in Northern Ireland with the IRA campaign, um, the bombs on um, in on mainland Britain, including the, uh, London, um, and then of course. Um, 9-11 happened and um, the whole world changed really. Uh, and I started covering Al-Qaeda and Islamic terrorism, went to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, and, and got quite involved in all that. Um, now, the, the other day I was giving a talk to another group of students and one of them uh, asked me, um, you know, what are the qualities or what are the specific job specs for joining the intelligence service, uh, for joining MI6? Um, and the first thing, I, and, and I repeat today, complete disclaimer, I do not work for MI6. Uh, I've never worked for MI6. Uh, I'm not employed by MI6. Um, and I've never spied. I've just been a journalist, um, all, you know, all my life. Um, but um, what, what, I, what I can tell you, as I told uh, that person, is, is because, you know, I've got to know a lot of these people over the years, um, is that um, if, and I say this to any students here, or if you, if you know any students interested in this, that they have quite a good selection process. Uh, it begins slightly off-putting, like so much these days with a sort of, a kind of human resource computer thing that all goes into, you know, questionnaire on a computer and the computer analyzes your questions and then the human resource people feedback 
to head off is saying, you know, we're going to serve this lot out, this lot quite interesting, let's go for an interview. And then the question is, you know, what, what are the qualities they're looking for in the first face-to-face -face interview? And it's interesting because they're, they're looking for um, people who are curious, um, people uh, who, whatever education they've had, and they might have gone to privileged public school education, they could have gone to Eton, they could have gone to Stonyhurst, they could have gone Ampleforth, whatever, they could have gone to state school, you know. Um, they have to sort of have done something outside the box of, of their formal education. So uh, they might have a first, they're also looking for sort of pretty good degrees. Uh, intellectual excellence is pretty important. Um, but outside the, the, the formal kind of box of education, they're looking for young people who have traveled, um, who have shown a genuine interest by what they've done, either working refugees or, or traveling or um, living in another country, of empathy with other cultures, getting to know other cultures and getting to know why other cultures think differently about certain issues, um, which all this will become relevant when, when I get on to Water Bell. Um, so, um, uh, and and the, the the other thing which surprised me is humility. Um, and I said, yeah, humility. Why humility? So, well, we're also looking for, for people who who are not righteous, um, don't feel they're right, uh, but believe in right um, and have integrity and and uh, play to truth um, and have a certain ethical conduct. Um, who also do not bend to power. Therefore, be like the FT um, motto, beyond fear or favor. So whether the, before a president, head of a bank, uh, whoever the person is, uh, they are not gonna be overawed and, and pay to that person's power. Um, they're gonna be critical, inquisitive, uh, questioning. Um, which brings me to, um, to, to Walter Bell. Um, the reason I, I I got involved with Walter originally, I mean, 40 years separated us. Um, Walter was a friend of my late father. I'm delighted to see that there's someone here who's, whose father also worked with my father. My father was in British intelligence in uh, World War II in the, in the Spanish embassy. Um, sorry, in the British embassy in Madrid. And... Uh, and obviously, once in it, you're never really out of it, uh, but you keep all your friends through the years. And um, when I came back from Argentina in 86, um, my father said, well, there's a, there's a friend of mine who would like to take you for lunch at the Travellers, uh, his club. Uh, and Travellers were well known for a club of spies, among others. Um, it didn't take us a rocket sciences to figure out he had something to do that. Anyway, I met this guy in the downstairs um, bar already on his sort of third dry martini, and we knocked off a sort of bottle of claret, and and we we basically hit it off. Uh, he was very interested in what I had to say about Argentina, what I'd learned there, what I'd learned behind the scenes, and uh, and um, as my career progressed, um, we would meet now and again, and he would never tell me anything about in detail about what he'd really done in his life, um, other than he'd been in the foreign service. Um, and we, we, got, we got on very well, and I met his wife, uh, his American wife, Tatty, who I will um, mention again uh, briefly um, in, in a moment, um, Tatty Spatz. Um, so fast forward um, from that meeting, uh, in, in 2004, Walter Bell dies at, the, at, the, at a ripe age of, of 94, I think it was. Um, <clears throat> and um, I remember there was, there was an obituary, a whole page obituary that appeared in the Times. Uh, and it was a classic Times obituary, which you read. Uh, I mean, Jeff Carling over there, sort of in the diplomatic service, know exactly what I mean, that, that you, it says, Far, far more by what it's not written than what, what is actually published in the sense that there was a lot about him being in the Foreign Service and 
having worked in Washington during and, and New York during World War II yeah. and then in London, and then being posted in other overseas assignments. And it mentioned uh, Kenya, India, the Caribbean. And then it also mentioned a rather important thing was that um, he'd been given one of the top white hall in decorations, which is the, um, the CMG, uh, Call Me God, as they call it in Whitehall. Um, and he'd also been given the US uh, um, Medal for, 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 for Freedom uh, in 1947 after the war, which is given to very few uh, non-Americans. Um, so that gave you a hint of what, uh, that he obviously had a rather more interesting life than was actually uh, shared in the obituary. Um, but the next thing that happened is um, that I got a, a phone call from his widow, Tatty, um, who said, can you come around to Andre Square, which is where they had a flat, um, uh, because I want to share something with you. So I sort of turned up and uh, I was met by Tatty. Uh, and behind her, I could see in the, in the sitting room, which I knew very well from the previous visits, absolutely covered in boxes. Uh, filled with papers. And uh, she said, um, these are Walter's papers uh, covering his entire uh, life. Um, and uh, it, it was his desire and it's my wish that you have them uh, because uh, it's up to you what you do with them. Uh, but uh, we both felt that if anyone is going to know the real story of Walter Bell, it should be you. Um, so I went off with these boxes and that was 2004. Um, I didn't actually really get, true honesty, I didn't really get down to it uh, till COVID. Um, why? Because as I mentioned, I was writing about five or six other books, um, including Cristiano, Cristiano and, uh, and Leo, uh, Maradona, Pope Francis, uh, various other people um, playing to my various interests. Um, and um, I, I was also trying to run a family um, and also um, run the, you know, be chairman of the British Spanish Society and previously vice chairman. Um, so when COVID came, uh, my dear wife said, if you don't do something with those boxes, I'm going to shred them because they're taking up half the house. Uh, and it's come to a point when you've got to do something about it. So I spent sort of several days going through them, and, and I basically, you know, it was like, as they say in the trade, pure treasure. Um, I mean, what, what I was engaging with were uh, hundreds of private papers, correspondence, uh, notes, uh, private memoirs he kept, um, which he hand, hadn't handed into head office. Um, and um, it took me several months to order them in a kind of, I mean, a future narrative in terms of the various episodes of his life, uh, because they're all over the place, all over the place. It was like an academic's nightmare. It was certainly a journalistic nightmare to, to make sense of it. Uh, and, and gradually it was like putting together a jigsaw and, and, and it all coming together. And I thought, my God, you know, this is an extraordinary book, <laughs> potential book. Um, and uh, so I, I started looking at it and, and what I realized was that, um, you know, and my journalist instinct kicked in, kicked in here and also certainly my academic background as well. Um, I wasn't simply going to write the, story, uh, the book based on what he was saying. I, I had to double check a lot of what he was saying uh, because of the world he was moving in. I mean, you know, spies are trained to, to be capricious and maybe uh, not tell the truth sometimes. But I had no reason really to doubt the authenticity, certainly not the authenticity of the papers, but secondly, the honesty of a narrative which was current thoughts. I mean, these were letters written at the time, uh, notes taken at the time. So very little of it was with the evidence of hindsight, uh, which was important. Um, so what, what, what emerged from, those, from, from that treasure 
um, what emerged was the most extraordinary, uh, colourful life to a certain extent. Um, this chap, Walter, um, was the third of um, three siblings, uh, born, uh, believe it or not, into a small Kent village where his father was the local Anglican vicar. Um, his ancestry, however, um, was quite interesting because his grandfather, Aloysius, was the founder of the News of the World in the 19th century. News of the World at that time was not what it became under Murdoch, the News of the Screws. I mean, it was all the, all the News of the Screws, I think they caught it, wasn't it? But it was, it was a sort of serious Sunday paper that reached out for the emerging, rising working classes. Uh, it wasn't particularly salacious at the time. And it was, it was quite a serious newspaper, and it was eventually sold off to, uh, to someone else, and it ended up in Murdoch's um, hands, and, and he, he turned into a sort of sleaze paper. Um, but um, Walter's father didn't, decided he wasn't going to go down gen the, the journalistic track, and, and he had a vacation. He worked uh, for for the poor in, East, uh, in the east of London, and he decided to um, uh, become a vicar. Um, so Walter is born in 1909, and here, historians among you, you really have to sort of put yourself, what's happening there? It's the end of the Victorian era, it's, it's Edwardian era. Um, there's, there's this sort of rather kind of golden idea of the Edwardian era being this sort of wonderful, you know, uh, bright young things and people are having wonderful parties and it's all ter being turned into a sort of uh, wonderful theatre. I mean, in fact, it was a moment of great social tension and, and um, um, you know, the sort of union rights beginning to, to kick in, the Labour Party beginning to, to be, be a serious party, um, all sorts of things going on here. Um, but he also belonged to a generation <laughs> Uh, too young to have fought in the First World War and therefore utterly uh, traumatised by what he heard about it um, and feeling a bit guilty, actually, that he hadn't been part of the generation that got gone over the trenches and led their men. Um, but, so he, by the time he gets um, sent to a private school to Tunbridge um, after, the, um, after the Great War, uh, the First World War, um, he is living all that, um, but he happens to be sent to a private school um, with a reputation for bullying and, and sort of gassing and like most private schools, um, boarding schools were at that time. Um, in fact, a, a previous um, well-known um, pupil was Ian Forster, the novelist, who'd been there several years before, but Forster wrote uh, that if you wanted to understand the philicism and, and the snobbery of British imperialism. You just had to look at the people educated in the schools like Tunbridge, um, uh, which was, of course, to, you know, false of talking at the end of the uh, of the 19th century going into the into the 20th century. So Walter um, then comes out of, of, of Tunbridge, having done what then uh, was called the Oxford, Oxford and Cambridge certification board, which meant that if you did that exam and you came out with semi-flying colours with a good reference of your headmaster, uh, you would probably go to <laughs> Cambridge. Um, in fact, poor old Walter found himself as a, as the third son uh, drawing the short straw uh, at a time when his family was getting into financial straits, so they couldn't afford to send him to Oxbridge. Um, this is when he came out of school. So he spent the next six years uh, taking on teaching jobs. And uh, remember what I was telling you about before about the um, job spec. Um, and not only sort of teaching in, in, in small schools and earning a, a living um, that way, but uh, in order to travel. Um, and he, um, so by the early 1930s, uh, this young chap was on his own volition was heading towards Northern Europe at a time of huge convulsion, uh, the rise of the Nazi party in Germany, obviously, uh, also in Austria. Um, 
there was, you know, he was he was witnessing all this at first hand and being absolutely horrified by it. Um, it it um, politicized him uh, in an ideological way. Uh, he became a sort of socialist. Um, he campaigned for the Labour Party um, in the run up to the 1929 um, general election for Ramsay MacDonald. Um, befriended several left wing um, uh, MPs like Oliver Letwin. Um, and then he, um, he, he decides um, that he's gonna, while he's teaching that he's going to study for the bar. Um, and so he starts studying law uh, and he, um, he studies, he goes to the inner temple and, um, and he, he becomes almost a qualified barrister. Um, at which point uh, he looks across the road and sees the LSE and says, I want to go, uh, I want to go to university, you know, uh, and I'm going to go to, I'd like to go to LSE. And of course, his father Vicky, was absolutely horrified because this was the godless university. Um, this was the modern university founded at the end of the 19th century by the Fabian, the Socialist Fabian Society, the members of. Uh, didn't believe in religion, you know, uh, full of Marxists, semi-Marxists at the time. Um, and, um, but he was intent on doing this. Um, at the same time, and this is the curious complexity of, of the man, um, he was developing, he was an absolute consummate social networker, uh, developing ties with people in positions of influence, both in the judiciary and in, in politics, um, and indeed people close to uh, the intelligence services. Um, so, difficult to believe this, but I only just got hold of his personal file, uh, which was very kindly dug up for me uh, from some archive in Dorset um, by the curator of the LSE library. Um, I only got it about a week ago, uh, and I got his personal file. And what it shows is that he he basically, having taken that Oxford and Cambridge certificate, he applies to, to come into the LSE to be to study economics. And um, the reply he gets from, I mean, you, this bureaucracy will be familiar to you. And there's um, some bureaucracies in, in, in universities haven't changed. But the answer that comes back is, is that the certificate is no good for the LSE um, because it shows that you study scripture and that you you know that we don't we don't recognize this as a as, as a good um, as something that you should be studying so you would have to retake uh, the London certificate and of course you know this would involve more weeks more expenses and all that he said Look, I want to be a, an undergraduate and start you know I want to start the autumn term of 1934 studying economics and then you get an extraordinary letter from uh, from a, uh, a, a well-known international jurist, jurist who was at the Inner Temple, one of his contacts, uh, who was Fichiri. Uh, Fichiri, if you look him up, was one of the most eminent jurists around, who writes on behalf of Water and says, this is ridiculous. This, you, this is purely administrative. You've got to let this young, talented young man um, proceed with his degree um so he he, he begins his degree um and and, and uh, goes to several lectures and at the same time gets a tap on his shoulder and i mean this this is all true difficult to believe uh around um november um 34 um and he gets called to queen anne's gate near Parliament Square, which was then the um, secret headquarters of MI6. Uh, and he gets interviewed uh, and he, he gets offered a job, which is uh, in New York um, as assistant passport officer. Now that might seem unbelievably drab, but the passport office was the cover name for MI6 offices around the world. They obviously weren't called you know, MI6 or even the foreign office, they were just called passport offices. Um, so you have this chap, uh, you know, aged 26, not yet 26, um, writing to the LSE and said, terribly sorry, but I'm going to have to leave my course because I've been offered a job in the passport office in New York. 
uh, where they need some legal, it needs some legal advice. Um, I mean, it it it, it is seems unbelievable that this is how it was, you know. And there, so water arrives in, in, in America. I mean, can you imagine this young guy crossing the Atlantic, he crosses the Atlantic as you did in those days in this ocean liner. It was a wonderful time getting there. And um, he arrives in New York and, and his, his job really uh, between his arrival and, and the start of World War II is, is to try and uh, be one of the people as an influencer to try and get the Americans uh, eventually to join us, join the British uh, and come into the war. Um, now, I mean, given what we're now living with, with a certain uh, Mr. Trump and things, um, there was a Gallup poll uh, conducted in the United States in uh, circa 1938. This is when Czechoslovakia was being invaded, when Poland was about to be invaded, when the Brits were you know, Churchill was warning, you know, Hitler's Hitler our door uh, across across the uh, pond. Uh, a Gallup poll conducted nationwide in the state showed that 13, 1-3% of the Americans uh, were prepared to go into World War II. Uh, the rest were totally anti-intervention uh, and they were pro-America first, i.e. we had Disaster, disastrous decision to go into the First World War in the last few weeks. The First World War, where 22,000 of our boys died because the Brits asked us to come in, we're not going to do that. And that was what MI6 station in New York was up against. Um, so the first part of, 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 of his, his career was really as, as um as part of a unit that was 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 was, was working on this in, in a big way, and of course, it is now well known history that um, it took Pearl Harbor, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, for um, Roosevelt to finally tell Churchill, right, we're declaring war, uh, not just on Japan but on Germany. Um, at which point, um, a uh, an organization was set up in. In, in New York, um, where uh, called British Security Coordination, which was set up by MI6, and it was up with everything from propaganda to uh, COVID operations to liaison with the Americans, um, and um, Walter started working for that outfit. Um, fast forward, he was sent to Mexico, uh, managed to stop a an attempt by the Germans to run the oil embargo out of Topico in, in, in Mexico. And consequently, the American Navy blew it out of the water. Uh, so that was quite a success. Um, and then by, by the time uh, sort of Roosevelt had decided to go into the war, um, thanks to his efforts and others, um, the, the American public, uh, media, you know, key uh, stakeholders were pretty prime. People in Wall Street, uh, uh, people in in uh, New York Times, people in Washington Post, they were all trying to support the uh, Allied cause. Um, and Walter spends the rest of World War II um, liaising as the key man with the FBI um, and with the nascent CIA uh, organization, which is the OSS. Um, up to 1942, uh, uh, at which point um, the OSS start landing literally in London, uh, dozens and dozens of their officers, because the whole intelligence operation with the occupation of France uh, moves to London. Uh, and Walter is relocated to London and spends the rest of the war liaising uh, with the Americans on COVID operations and uh, top secret operations. Um, and then he, um, after the war in, in, in 1946, he gets appointed as private secretary to the uh, then UK uh, ambassador, Lord Inverchapel, who was quite an eccentric guy, uh, not least, um, well, at the time it was eccentric, uh, thank God it's not eccentric anymore. He was bisexual, rather liked American boys rather more than his Chilean wife. And he had sort of, you know, Walter knew all about this, kept very, very, very loyal to his ambassador. But the most eccentric thing of it all was that 
previous to that posting, he'd been uh, HMG's ambassador in Moscow and had gone on quite well with Stalin, um, which led some people in the Houses of Commons to suggest that Inverchapel was the Soviet agent, which he wasn't. But Stalin, as a farewell present, uh, you can believe it or not, gave Inverchapel a valet and a masseurs uh, who happened to be um, a German Russian. Uh, um, <laughs> who then arrived in Washington with, with Inverchapel. And um, Inverchapel and him got on very well, and he looked after the ambassador very well. But such was the uh, pressure in the House of Commons and, and the Foreign Office and things that um, uh, Inverchapel sort of very kindly suggested um, to his valet, uh, probably be better if you leave. But, you know, don't worry, uh, I will guarantee you a job for life on my estate in Scotland. So, you know, this semi-Russian heads, heads, heads to the Highlands and, and ends up um, marrying a Scottish girl and running a fish and chip shops for the rest of his life. So, um, you know, that from Russia with love ends up, is, and that's a real cameo. Um, we could have made a movie, another from Russia with love movie out of that. Um, so again, fast forwarding, um, water, um, Water, by, by the time he's finished in Washington, um, work in Washington, he, he, one of the people he was working with, uh, or happened to be in the embassy when he arrived, was one Donald McLean, uh, who was at the time first secretary in the embassy, foreign office uh, career diplomat um, on the rise, who, as some of you may know, was subsequently exposed as one of the Cambridge Five. Um, so... At that time, um, Water didn't uh, know about this, nor did um, his ambassador. In fact, no one else in the embassy knew about it. Um, he was feeding uh, the Soviets top level intelligence um, on intercepted traffic from, um, from the ambassador, going back to the forwards to, to London. Um, but Water actually, without knowing any of this at the time, got on quite well with Donald McLean. Um, and um, but before uh, McLean then gets moved on to Cairo, uh, and in fact, um, misses Walter's wedding in Washington by three months. And um, McLean at that time was married to an American. Um, Walter had started going out with uh, Tatty Spatz, who was uh, the oldest daughter of General Spatz, one of the top World War II American generals. Um, happened to be Eisenhower's favorite Air Force general in charge of the whole uh, Air Force campaign in World War II. Uh, and they marry uh, in Georgetown uh, in 1948. Um, at which point, uh, Walter is beginning to feel that MI6, there's some kind of glass ceiling uh, and um, he's not gonna go right up to management. He doesn't wanna go up to management. Uh, uh, there are people on the selection committee that uh, he doesn't particularly like. Uh, irony of ironies, as with the evidence of hindsight, one of the people on the selection committee was one Kim Philby, um, uh, who was obviously picking his own kind of people. Um, and at that, uh, co coincidentally, or because he'd been uh, uh, recommended, uh, he uh, Walter gets offered a job by the head of MI5 um, to come over to MI5. Now, uh, forget about what MI5 is today. MI5 at that time uh, was given priority status in intelligence gathering terms and in any other secret terms or cover terms uh, over MI6 or any other government agency in the British colonies at the time and the Commonwealth. Um, which meant that if you were posted abroad by MI5, it was the equivalent of a kind of what an MI6 station uh, posting would be today. Um, so he finds himself uh, posted to Kenya um, in, uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the 1940s, uh, beginning of the 1950s, in the run-up to Mau Mau, uh, the Mau Mau insurgency, one of the bloodiest insurgencies uh, suffered by the British Empire, uh, with probably in terms of bloodshed only equaled by what happened in India at various times. 
Um, and he uh, he's there in, in the run-up to Mau Mau, but actually moves out before uh, Mau Mau actually turns out. Um, what's interesting about uh, his reports back to London was that he was saying, look, I know what, what colonial authorities in London are building up to. They're going to building up to this huge repression of this insurgency, concentration camps, executions, um, just playing the tough, the tough nut. Um, this is a nascent African nationalist movement. Uh, we've got to understand what motivates them. What motivates them is decades of, of intolerance, abuse, racism, um, injustice. Um, and unless we address that, we're going to be landing with a much bigger problem later on, uh, which is extraordinary kind of um, integrity, actually, of someone to take a different line when there was enormous pressure just to take uh, a repressive uh, attitude towards the whole thing. Um, but on the back of his... Uh, MI5 rated him very highly for the way that he he seemed to be have the guts to... Uh, share the intelligence he had in a way that he didn't bend simply to the diktats of his masters. Um, and he was subsequently posted to India with the first independent government of, uh, uh, of Nehru uh, and there liaised with uh, Nehru's intelligence services. Um, and he went on to the Caribbean uh, where he did some similar things um, in the Caribbean at a time when the Caribbean was was politically quite volatile. Um, this was pre-Cuban Revolution, but uh, things were getting uh, quite tough in places like Guyana, uh, which was um, the subject of a subsequent CIA-backed coup against the socialist um, prime minister there. Um, now, um, I'm reaching the end of my, my part on this. Um, to 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 get to uh, the latter stages of um, uh, Walter's career, um, a very extraordinary thing happened to Walter uh, at the beginning of the 1960s when um, he was basically uh, Macmillan, who was then the Prime Minister, decides his famous wind of change speech uh, that British foreign policy towards the colonies has to change and it's going to become much more engaging with, with nascent independent movements. We've got to be, we mustn't be uh, excluded from the process. We've got to accompany the process, manage it, make sure that it's still in the interests of, uh, of Britain and its empire. Uh, and, and therefore, it, one of the areas, uh, given the Cold War, uh, that we can help is by countering the increasing Soviet influence in places like Africa, and India. Um, and um, so Walter, extraordinarily enough, uh, somewhere in Whitehall, people sort of clock the memory of his first time in Kenya, say, yeah, this guy is someone who understood something about the nascent African nationalism at the time. And what's more, the guy who's just about to be the first independent president of Kenya, one Jomo Kenyatta, has asked that Walter Bell uh, come back to Kenya to be the main liaison officer on security matters with the first independent government um, with the approval of the director general of MI5. Um, so Walter and Tati find themselves back in Kenya um, and they're there until 1967, uh, advising Kenyatta on potential Soviet-backed communist coups and uh, various things like that, and the infiltration of Nairobi University by the KGB and, and lots, of, lots of Cold War stuff, you know. Um, now, the, 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 in his, you know, it's, it's almost like a kind of sort of, you know, magic realism undercurrent of history. It, it, it's so coincidental. I mean, as Ortega I said, used to say, we are what we are in our circumstances. Is it all circumstantial? Is there some sort of mysterious narrative that puts us all down the same current? You know? uh, Kenyatta himself uh, studied in this place, in the LSE, uh, 
and he happened to be in the NSE uh, in 1934. Um, and at that time, one Walter Bell was here. Um, I can say, hand on heart, I found nothing in the papers suggesting that Walter and Kenyatta met while they were here. Uh, what I can tell you is that it's perfectly plausible that they met in the corridors or they met sharing some, some lecture. Uh, the fact is that Kenyatta at that time had just arrived from Moscow, where he'd been studying in Moscow University, and was in a um, irony of ironies, an MI5 file, uh, saying that he was a suspect uh, Soviet agent, uh, which is not true. Um, but there you have fast forward, and you have MI5 having put him under surveillance from the special branch when he was at LSE, um, ends up. Uh, with Walter Bell liaising uh, with Joe and Kenyatta on behalf of MI5 so they can all work together. Um, quite, quite extraordinary. Um, so he retires, uh, and there um, I, I go into uh, really what leads to the, um, the title of the book. Um, because if you know everything, I'm sure some of you know about about Cambridge Five, which we've been written about so much. Um, and you've read John Carey and uh, forget about Bond because Bond bears no resemblance at all to any real life spy, although he was a great recruitment agent when Dr. No came out. Um, you know, my six, you had all these public school boys thinking they were going to have a line of women going to jump into bed with them. But you know, that, that is a great recruitment agent at the time, but it, it was not real. Um, so, so um, Walter, uh, when he was in Kenya the first time, uh, was hugely impressed uh, by the humility and sacrifice and service for others in the slums of Nairobi among, among, among the native Africans, uh, Kenyans, uh, of the Irish Catholic missionaries. Um, as a result of which, uh, he converted to, to Roman Catholicism. Um, and this was a process that, that had been building up during the 1930s because he'd started reading uh, Jack Maritain and Christopher Dawson, the great uh, exponents of Catholic social teaching as a third way between uh, Marxism on one side and fascism on the other. Uh, he'd been quite impressed by that. Um, and then, you know, the subconscious came up again in Kenya. He converted. Um, and his, his faith in, in a God of some kind, um, very different to that which in the vicarage of his father, who he regarded as a, a rather sort of pious totalitarian who insisted on taking his first confession and, and saying, you know, um, sort of doing sort of weird things while he was uh, as a young boy. Um, he, he, he deepened in his, um, his faith, uh, his Catholic faith. Um, so um, given that spies are quite complex characters, I, 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 I sort of developed the, the leitmotif of Walter Bell. Why was it that he didn't follow the people he'd worked with? Because he knew Philby as well. He'd worked with Philby, the other key, um, Cambridge Five. He knew Burgess. Um, and he'd been a socialist at LSE. Why, why didn't he go with the, to the Soviets? You know? uh, why didn't he go with the Moscow? Uh, and and the, basically, the answer lies in, in basically um, two things. His wife, Tati, uh, with whom he remained uh, happily married uh, on a very, very long night. They didn't have children, but she was uh, an ally, a supporter, uh, a, a wonderful lady, uh, they were like this, uh, in all the postings come through very clearly in his papers. Um, and, and the other one was this sort of faith or at least search with doubt uh, for a God um, and for a meaning to his life. And um, I mentioned that one of the psychological states that are developed by many spies is a thing called camel's back syndrome, the camel's back syndrome, which is basically a neurosis that you develop, a manic depressive uh, neurosis that you develop 
which can be summed up as the weight of so much of what you know and the weight of so much that you can't speak about becomes so intense that it almost, the burden of it breaks you psychologically. Now, spies deal with it in different ways. Some of them have nervous breakdowns. A lot of them have had nervous breakdowns after the Second World War. A lot of them, I know, had nervous breakdowns as a result of Al-Qaeda. Um, but Walter managed it. Uh, and I think he managed it uh, through his um, through his love for his wife, uh, the support of his wife, um, and also um, his his faith. Um, and so I basically conclude the book um, um, by, by basically saying that um, he was, like so many in secret intelligence, Bell was a complex, ambiguous character and could be elusive with motives that were not always quite what they seemed. He was no knight in shining armor and was prone to human and professional failings, as I've tried to identify in these pages, but he had integrity, a man of faith with a strong moral sense of justice and a belief in democracy. He still found space for nuance and irony, for a lightness a lightness that contrasted with the heaviness of ideology that turned some of his generation towards extremes of intolerance and even betrayal. Not that betrayal would ever have been an option for Walter Bell, loyal to his church, friends, family colleagues, king and country. He was a truly faithful spy. That's it. We've set the ceiling for uh, quite a lot of discussions. So, who wants to start <laughs> asking questions? Just please say your name and where you're uh, from. Mariella Hargreaves. Thanks for that, Jimmy. Um, I just wondered, did you have to clear any of, of your material with with MI five or MI six? Um, thanks for that question. Um, the simple answer is that. Um, there were people who wanted me to clear it, and uh, I, I thought I'd, I'd take them on. Uh, well, not take them on. I thought I'd bluff it in the sense that if you want to, if you want to clamp down on me, go for it. My publisher is sitting over there. There was part of us that said, "Come on, for Christ's sake, arrest me." <laughs> uh, this, will, this will boost our sales. You know? um, but uh, I mean, the you know, I, I'm not being some cavalier about this or. or Macho about this, uh, because I'd covered intelligence, okay, um, and been vetted and all that. Uh, when I went through the papers, uh, I had the back of my mind the whole time: official secrets, act, official secrets, act, official secrets. Act, because you know, whenever I wrote something for the paper, uh, this was you know, it, you mustn't get a D notice, you know, I mustn't, mustn't get a call from Whitehall saying, you know. Uh, we're going to impound the paper, or, you know, you're going to be arrested tomorrow and find this on the high court, you know. Um, and I was very conscious of this reading the paper because the one thing that, uh, you know, for those of you who ever wish to enter this area, that, that one thing that is a no-no is, is, is naming agents, uh, okay, because, you know, the way MI6 and indeed the CIA operate, but MI6, you know, you, you have a, a field officer He's not a support staff, he's a field officer, and, and he develops through human contacts, sources, a field, a field of agents, you know, uh, who feed him information. Um, and SIS or MI6 position is, is that the reason the Official Secret Act exists and also why MI6 files are never released, unlike MI5 files, uh, to the public. Um, and in fact, papers are restricted. Is is that um, it, it would undermine the whole organisation because no agent would ever trust us again um, if if agents in the past were named with 
still while they're alive or if they had children who inherited their, their name uh, or wives who outlived them. That's the reason, okay? So uh, with two or three exceptions where you can read between the lines, um, I, I didn't see him naming agents. Uh, I, I saw him naming agents of influence, which is slightly different. Um, so um, I did show it to uh, someone very high up in MI6, uh, extra officially, um, uh, because I wanted him to read the book. And, and both Stuart and I, my publisher, and I wanted a really good comment from him about the book. Um, and also, <clears throat> I managed him to chair one of the first um, gigs we did on the book, um, which was in a private setting for members only. Um, <clears throat> and he agreed to be in conversation with me. Um, and he, he, he said there, and we quoted him, he said, this is an extraordinary and very rare cachet of payment. <coughs> Sorry. Where you have described a cog in the machine of 20th century intelligence during a very important time. <coughs> so we got what we wanted. Um, but I hope that answers your question. So no one has raided my house yet. <laughs> um, but I intend to give, um, we'll get, I hope they'll pay for it, but <coughs> the papers to an eminent university. Jimmy, there's a couple of guys out there with trench coats and trill beers and handguns. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. There may be a back entrance out there. I was going to say, you'll know what's happening in your house at the moment. Yeah. So, um, more questions? Well, if I can get this going. Uh, was there any mention of Graham Green in the Can you just say your name and where you're oh, from? Catherine Davis. Any mention of Graham Green in this paper? Uh, there was no mention of Graham Green, but again, thanks for asking that because I actually, Graham Green was a great friend of my father's. Um, in fact, my father, um, before World War II, um, subsequent to World War II, was, um, was a publisher and he published Graham Green's first book. Um, and um, as you know, Graham Green went into all those things. Um, um, <laughs> I do mention Greg Reed in the book. Um, why do I mention him? Because he coincided with, um, although Walter doesn't write about him, um, in Kenya. I mean, you might know this, but Walter, uh, sorry, Walter, uh, Graham was, um, who I met actually, I'll never forget meeting him. Um, and he gave me a wonderful endorsement in my first book, um, which was a crazy jealousy um, for a first 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 book by, by a young author. <clears throat> but Graham was sent by the Sunday Times uh, to do three feature articles on the build-up to Mau Mau and Mau Mau, uh, which were brilliant. Uh, I've got them in on in my archive. And, and um, but what's interesting is that um, you know, once a spy, always a spy, but Graham was he was, apart from being a bloody good novelist, he, he, was, he was actually a very good journalist. Uh, he showed it when he went out to Vietnam. And so he was very good at, at developing sources. Um, and he spent a lot of time talking to the Irish missionaries um, because he knew that they were among the people. Uh, and it's like, um, you know, my experience as a foreign correspondent during my mass in America, uh, during the military regimes, the, my first port of call were the Jesuits, because I was educated by the Jesuits. The Jesuits knew what was going on because they were with the people. They were also educating the people who were persecuting the people. More questions? Let me just go, if, uh, while we wait for questions, uh, about the LSE 1934. Yeah. And so LSE 1934, I just wanted to check how big the LSE was. So I was looking practically on my phone mm. and found that uh, I couldn't find the number of students, but they said that a canteen was open uh, with uh, 
had a capacity of 400, which was could host almost the entire student body of the LSE at that time. You know, it's not, not a surprise for me. Uh, so we're talking about 500 maximum. You know. Uh, when I joined, I said it was 2,500, and that was in 1995. So, in that respect, uh, it's very, very likely that John Kenyatta had water bell net, not just in the corridors, but if you have a community of 500, you're going to have another one. But I have a question for you is uh, are you entirely certain that uh, Walter Bell never passed secrets mm -hmm. to the Soviets? Um. Uh, yeah, I can tell you why. Um, because, um, as you can probably imagine, uh, when the Cambridge Five um, affair blew, blew in the media, okay, well, long before that, um, the Americans were aware of what was going on. Some people in MI6 were aware of what was going on. Some people in MI5. There were lots of internal inquiries, okay? Um, the problem was, as, as some of you know now, I mean, the, you know, the, it was the old boy network. You know, how could it possibly be true that that you know, Philby is um, is a Soviet spy? How can it be that Don McLean, this, this fast track sort of Foreign Office guy, is um, an agent? Um, you know, it just can't be true. But um, so they basically got away with it. They they sort of they all. You know, Phil, we got to Moscow, as you know, um, and Burgess and McLean, the two of them went off at the same time. Uh, at which point, they, you know, they had a lot of uh, bad blood, really, coming from across the pond from the Americans saying, you Brits, you know, how could you possibly employ someone like Burgess, who's an absolute alcoholic, or someone like Don McLean, must have been, you know, why, why did you employ people like that? And Philby, um, we suspected him, you know, long before you lot, but you didn't do anything about him. You just let him go because you didn't want to put him on trial, um, which is partly true. Um, but the point to address your point is, is that um, there were big inquiries that went on uh, internally at White, in Whitehall, um, and everyone was pulled in who had been remotely. Uh, Involved with any of them, uh, and I've got, I have no doubt at all that Walter Bell was 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 very very heavily interrogated. Um, you might say, well, actually, it must have been a real double spy because he wouldn't have lied through his teeth and got away with it. But um, there's no evidence in in the, in the the KGB papers that were briefly uh, came to light um, in the early 1990s when we were all friendly. Um, before Putin turned up um, and academics were going to Moscow and being shown KGB files by friendly Russian historians and things like that. Um, absolutely, um, what there is, is, is which I quoted a KGB document where Philby is reporting on Walter Bell during World War II um, in a way that makes it absolutely clear that if Philby had thought he was going to recruit Walter, he decided that he was not a communist, um, that he wasn't a dogmatic Stalinist like, uh, like Kim Bulby was, uh, like the Cambridge Five were, that were completely Stalinist ideologues. You know? um, and then the final point is that um, to this day, Walter Bell retains the two medals I mentioned right at the beginning, which are the the two, probably two of the highest awards on either side of the Atlantic that anyone in, in, in government service can get. One is the CMG uh, on, on the British side, and the other one is the, um, the Medal of Freedom. Um, and, uh, you know, it would have been taken away from them uh, if uh, there'd been any suspicion of him um, being a, a double agent or whatever. Um, but it's a question that obviously I asked myself at the beginning of this whole process: Was he the sixth man? Uh, and I, you know, my conclusion was was the one I reached. You know, um, you know, in a way, probably Stuart would have preferred me to have written the sixth man. But, but I mean, the fact was that um, hand on heart, the 
the on, on the balance of probability forensic analysis and call it what you want of, of a lot of time I spent researching this book and talking to a lot of people inside intelligence outside intelligence I mean um no definitely not yeah, you know, my my experience of spies is mainly James Bond films, mm. of course. But uh, <laughs> if the Soviets were to have a cell in the UK, will they only have one cell, or would they have separate cells that don't talk to one another and then know about one another? Well, I mean, it's it, it, again, it's, it's a good question. I think you know more about spies than you, you, you give to think. But the um, the, the fact is that the, the 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 main kind of penetration of British intelligence, which which began to be operated from Moscow in the mid 1930s. They they targeted Oxford and Cambridge, okay, because you know this was they regarded it as the, the universe of producing the elite, the establishment, and things. And if they penetrated that and recruited students there, they would be in very high places of influence in the establishment. Um, Although, obviously, like in all the other universities, there were people there of, of different ideologies. But LSE, as it always has been, but it certainly was in my time, um, you know, it, it's always been ideologically left-wing. You know? I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, I mean, I almost became a Marxist when I was studying it. Um, because my, my tutor was Marxist. More questions? I just, I just thought you didn't say the name. And, uh, I'm Stuart Lee, so I'm the publisher for this. But I just thought a couple of things I thought people might be quite interested is the great pub crawl, which I just thought is a little vignette, and also the bit about you know towards the end of his career with Dick White, you know, with the you know rehabilitation or you know the sort of which I just thought two little things that might be quite interesting. Yeah, well, um, Stuart calls um, knows the book better than I do. Um, <laughs> See, I had, to, I had to correct all its errors and it is like five million times. So anyway, regardless of what publishers um I can't I could at um okay, the two things that, that Stuart I mean um mentions. I, I talk about in some some anecdotal detail mm -hmm. um but based on on information that was given to me by by Tati by his um by his widow. Um, his Waters' dealings with the with um, with three of the um, Cambridge Five. I mentioned Donald McLean. The other one was um, Guy Burgess. The other one was Kim Philby. Guy Burgess, um, which some of you might know from films or from having read other books and things. Um, Guy Burgess, to this day, I can't imagine why he was ever recruited by any intelligence agency, but he was totally decadent um, in, in, in every sexual point of view. Um, he, um, at the time when, um, you know, certain activities were prohibited by law. Um, so he was a raving homosexual at a time when, you know, you had to keep your head down if, if, you, if you were gay, um, thank you. And Coral, that has changed, but the, you know, if you were in the in government service, right? But he managed to sort of get, get away with it. And the other thing was that he was a, a complete alcoholic, get drunk the whole time. Um, and I tell the I tell the story that um, one day in in the middle of World War Two, um, when Walter was, was in London uh, liaising with the Americans, um, he'd obviously met Burgess. Well, the circumstances, I'm not quite sure why or when um but burgess uh invited him to go on a the so-called karl marx pub crawl um now i don't know if any of you are familiar with the karl marx pub crawl because i've done part of it um <clears throat> but it is now quite popular among certain aficionados um you can look it up on the internet but it begins more or less where marx in his uh, time living in London when he was writing Das Kapital. He was living in Soho. Um, and then he eventually moved to, to North London, to Bellside Park, uh, around the Hampstead area. Um, he would walk um, along Tottenham Court Road 
uh, and drop in on several pubs along the way, some of which, four, four, of, four of which still exist to this day. Um, and uh, Marx actually liked his, his tipple, um, and in fact, re reportedly at one point, so I had a huge fight outside one of the pubs and was semi-arrested, but got away with it. Anyway, so Burgess begins with Bell, and by the time they got to the sort of uh, second pub, uh, he was so getting so appallingly kind of obnoxious, alcoholic, drunk, um, that Bell just sort of said, look, that's enough for the evening. I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. So he, he didn't do the full pub crawl with him. <laughs> um, the, other, the other thing, uh, what was the other thing? I'm just thinking about the Dick White, you know. Oh, yeah, the Dick White. Right. Okay, well, Dick White plays to, and the rest to your, your question. Uh, a very, very key part of the papers uh, I discovered was because of the detail of the correspondence, was um, revealed a very, very uh, enduring friendship uh, that Waterbell had with Dick White. Now, Dick White is probably, in, in terms of 20th century intelligence, British intelligence history, is probably the most highly regarded British intelligence officer because he is unique in having been the head of MI5 at one point and the head of MI6. And in fact, was moved from one to the other because of the Philby Cambridge affair, because he was the only person that trusted. He was almost like a kind of um, smiley of in Tinkatilla Soldier Spy. Um, and you have this incredible correspondence, which is at the time of the Cambridge Five affair, um, Dick White enlisting uh, Walter's assistance, what can only be described as a kind of, <laughs> in cynical terms, a damage limitation exercise, but actually uh, a, a, an attempt to put right what they both saw, and a lot of their colleagues felt, a huge injustice by some tabloid newspapers picking up on some Soviet misinformation, suggesting that the penetration of British intelligence was much bigger than, um, than the Cambridge Five, uh, and beginning to name some well-known uh, senior figures of intelligence as Soviet moles, uh, which is all complete invention. And it was a sort of classic, uh, Putin still trying to do the same thing now, but um, it's a classic kind of misinformation campaign, uh, fake news, call it really, which was at that time being done. And and uh, so Dick White and Water conducted a quite successful campaign to clear the name of two very senior uh, intelligence officers um, by working on uh, their sources in the Times um, and managing to uh, get the Times to publish a series of articles with a lot of detail about why these guys couldn't possibly be Russian agents. So that's what, what um, Stuart was referring to. But, but uh, um, I mean, that, that, that correspondence is among probably among a, a very, very interesting sequence of letters. Um, and uh, because it shows that uh, Dick White certainly held uh, Walter in high esteem. Um, and, um, and Walter held Dick White obviously in high esteem. But, but I, I think um, if I'd remembered that, I would have also used that as, as, as in the case of the defense, as it were, for those who might have thought that Walter. Uh, but I mean, you know, I, don't forget that I, I lived with Walter for, I mean, to live with Walter. Mm -hmm. I knew Walter from, from 1986 right through to his death, 2004. Um, and uh, what I lived with was a man who went to mass every morning at the oratory. This was in retirement, the London oratory. Every morning, the morning he go to mass. Um, and who, before he died, insisted on full rights of a Catholic uh, ceremony and things. You know, this was not kind of simulation. Let's go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm sorry, my name is Richard Fardy. I wondered, um, 
Was it um, generally approved for somebody to keep personal archive on that scale when they were working for the intelligence uh, services? I mean, are there any examples of people who've been in similar positions who also maintained large personal uh, archives? And the other, just on some totally different, um, pre presumably he knew that uh, Blunt was also a spy during the long period when Blunt wasn't uh, outed. So I wondered how that sort of squared with his... Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I know it's all to be about Blunt and, and, and nothing about Blunt is, yes, but you know, obviously he would have been in the know. Um, to address your, your first question, I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of... Uh, when, when I wrote the sort of the, the initial manuscript of the book, as I said earlier, I, I showed it to a high-level source in British intelligence, and I also showed it to two or three academics on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, very uh, experts in intelligence history, but also in, in um, Whitehall and all that, including Professor Peter Hennessy, who probably is the sort of the, the godfather of us all, um, um, and Chris Andrews and people like that, um, and they all uh, they all came back and said, "Oh, you know, it, this is pretty unique. Um, it, it, it is, um, you know, he should have probably handed it all in or destroyed it, uh, but he didn't. Um, and as as whether you know." I can't, I mean, I would say this, wouldn't I? But um, I defy anyone to uh, think of any, and I've read a lot of books on, on intelligence. Yeah. There's not one single book. Uh, I've read lots of biographies of spies, um, books on, on to do with, with spies and all that. Um, none of them, uh, particularly biographies, show uh, that people have had access to personal papers. All well, the authors had access to personal papers. Is the detail of it is is uh, is, is unique for, for obvious reasons. Um, but it does raise a a a, 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 a follow up question to yours, which just to bring it up to date. Um, and and I I talked about this a bit with talking to some students at uh, King's College of War Studies. They're, they're all sort of intelligence geeks. You know, know more about the subject than anyone in this room, including myself here. But um and 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 we brought it up to date. Um but you know it makes one think that uh I mean I I I, I sort of I don't envy um journalists, you know, authors, academics, students, uh, researchers. Um because this kind of stuff just won't be around, you know. Um, because you know, you do not have people these days writing letters as they used to. You do not generally have people writing memos in, in longhand. Um, you do not uh, basically leave traces around in emails or you know, you don't use WhatsApp. If you're in intelligence services because it's not encrypted, that you use something else, you know, all that sort of stuff. But but it would be difficult to imagine um, someone in about 15 years' time, say, writing based on the papers of an MI6 officer who served um, at the turn of the 20th century into the 21st century. But, but, of what fills me with always the reason I was, you know, still a believe in journalism and believe in, 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 in serious academic research is, is that um, where, the way intelligence has not shifted is the importance of human intelligence. You can have all the cyber stuff you want, you can have all, all the geeks you want, trying to crack codes, you know, get around AI, doing all that stuff. But nothing, nothing equates to good human intelligence, which is working your sources, your friendships, any information, because that's that's the stuff that really endures. Um, 
I'm seeing it. You know what? You might not see it as clearly as I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it in Gaza. I'm seeing it in Ukraine. Um, you know, you're seeing all sorts of things going on, but somewhere is not being seen. But there's a lot of human cut going on. Um, and some of it is actually quite public. You've got the head of the CIA in Paris as we speak in secret negotiations with the head of Mossad, uh, with the Qatar government, which in a sense represents, um, you know, a part of Hamas um, because they've got the offices in, in Qatar, um, trying to broker a deal on, on Gaza. You know? um, but, but, you know, you don't get that through intercepting each other's codes. You know, you sit at tables like this, winning the trust of the person at that table. And uh, the Putin thing is, 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 again, rather extraordinary because, you know, the Allies, well, the CIA definitely had people, uh, they had sources that were telling them weeks before the invasion of Ukraine that, um, that they were preparing to invade. Uh, and and that, that is, uh, they would have had someone, someone there. You know, you've got to be bloody careful uh, given the nature of the Putin regime. If he bumps off uh, the hero of last week, the way he's done, these kids were doing it. Yeah, I think uh, we're almost done, but just one question regarding the probably about universities now and change how spies have changed. Um, British universities have changed radically. So from the time of Walter Bell, uh, just as recently as 1980, only 8% of people in the age cohort went to universities. Now it's 40, 45. In, in what? In 1980. Yeah, but in what? 8% of the age cohort went to university. All right. Now it's 40, 45, but the university has be have become much bigger right. and much more international. The university like the UK, like the LSE, which is probably the most international in the world, we barely have any British students. We have very few, mostly of undergraduate. Yeah. Uh, postgraduate is more than 90% foreigners. How active do you think are spy rings and spy, the MI5, MI6, or other spy agencies in British universities these days? And I know you're happy speculators. Well, I mean, I yeah, I could say I couldn't possibly comment, but but um, well, I mean, you know, this is a, this is a very controversial subject, but but I mean, well, I can let me answer that by, you know, as I, as, as I said early on, um, I I covered um, when I was security and uh, intelligence and defense correspondent of the FT, I found myself covering the Northern Ireland, but then the Al Qaeda. Uh, Islamic fundamentalism. Okay, well, at that point, you know, several universities, uh, quite a few universities up and down the country, including this one, including SOAS, to name but a few in London, uh, you know, ha had MI5 agents uh, actively infiltrated uh, to keep tabs on su suspect um, people who, you know, might might be more than sympathetic towards um, Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, you can also take it as said that, you know, when it comes to the Chinese, there's probably quite of interest as well, um, and not to speak of, of Russians. Um, but um, I would say those, those three areas are quite, uh, quite, you know, continuing interest. Okay. So, thank you very much, Jimmy. Painful <laughs> sky, but like oh, there you are. So, you can get them there. And uh, for those of you that are interested, you can follow us at uh, the Gainab Life Center either on Twitter or on our website and LinkedIn. And we're going to have a series of uh, new events. I mean, they come thick and fast. Next uh, uh, Monday, on the 4th of uh, March, we have Louis Dijkstra from the European Commission on the Future of Cities. On the 5th, we have uh, the Spanish ambassador, Pascual Marco, talking about Spain, the uh, UK, and Europe. And then finally, on the 25th of uh, March, we have Salvador Illa, the former Minister of Health of Spain and now leader of the 
Catalan socialists coming also to give a talk. So just uh, keep po uh, posted, keep tuned, stay tuned, and looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you.